Hey, it's Mike here, and today, a video response about evolution and meat. The YouTube channel Seeker just tied up a three-part series on meat a few days ago with the video, Could We Evolve to Not Eat Meat? While this video had many valid points that I have no problem with at all, there are some others that I don't agree with, and several of you requested a response video. I also have a brand new evolutionary hypothesis that I have never shared before, so stay tuned. You may be familiar with Seeker. It's a science-based channel with a few million subscribers, and I have to say, I do appreciate a lot of Trace Dominguez's content. As for the video, I do agree with Trace on a lot of things, like how we had some ancestors that didn't eat meat, how we are getting way out of hand with our meat consumption, Every 10 seconds, McDonald's is churning through one cow. And that's just McDonald's. But again, I disagree with many parts of his views, particularly the unchecked assumption that meat played a massive, central, overarching role in making us human. Without meat, we would have never evolved to be these amazing world-conquering species that we have become to be. Without it, we would not be the majestic and gangly humans that we currently are. I.e. meat made us human. Now before I present my alternative view, he walks through evolutionary time a bit, starting about 15 million years ago. Millions of years ago. Most of our cousins and our ancestors are vegetarian. Purgatorius was a vegan. It was actually a set of different animals. So we've got small monkeys, larger apes, more gorilla sized. And Selanthropus walked upright. It ate plants and seeds and nuts. Then three to four million years ago, Australopithecus came on the scene, still didn't eat a lot of meat, mostly vegetarian. Then time goes on, we evolve into different species that ate more and more meat, and voila, we are modern meat-eating human machines. And eventually, we get to meat eating. When we get to the early homo groups, you know, we're homo sapien, for example, we started to go all in on the omnivorous diet and get more meat. And it's not like Trace is doing anything horribly wrong and unique here, he's just presenting the conventional view. If you look in the description at the Atlantic article he linked, he is largely reiterating the timeline from that article. Now the only study that he mentions in this video is the one in the journal Science about how slicing our meat allowed us to reduce our chewing because that's a good indication of what a species eats. And moving forward, that, that meat eating was also linked to changes in our anatomy. And it turns out Paleolithic humans ate meat. And that's why we don't have a strong bite force. Our gut is a little smaller. We have a longer small intestinal space. Our facial muscles are not as pronounced because we're not grinding lots of different plant matter down. And, rah, rah, and our brain can get bigger because we have that calorie dense steak bar that we can eat. Okay, now it's time to present my argument. I'm gonna have to take my sweater off for this. Actually, it's just getting hot. I'm just taking off my sweater because I'm getting hot. Was slicing meat with rocks and chewing less really the stepping stone we needed to evolve into the humans that we are that have conquered the world? That just doesn't sell me. If that was the case, how come lions aren't the smartest animals in the world? They can just gobble up meat and swallow it whole without chewing it hardly at all. And you're definitely joking yourself if you think that we were better hunters than lions before we even had stone-tipped spears. To emphasize this, let's look at the timeline where we had a major period of brain growth before we really had the tools or ability to hunt. From this chart, our brain size more than doubled from two and a half million years ago to 500,000 years ago. And scientists have put the earliest stone-tipped spears at 500,000 years ago. But going back to lions, you might be thinking, well, they were carnivores. We, we were omnivores. Plants plus meat, that's the golden ticket to intelligence. Okay, then why aren't bears or wolves the smartest ones? They are omnivores. No, you have to have a novel source of calories if you wanna be smarter than anybody else. I would argue that the role that we like to give meat is actually the role that starch is played in human evolution. Looking back at that chewing study, Trace didn't mention the study was also largely about starchy underground storage organs. So starch is already a part of this conversation. Going back in time, it appears that fruit was what got us up to chimpanzee intelligence and starch like fruit is a great source of brain fuel. It breaks down into glucose directly. Glucose is the fuel of the brain, but fat in meat needs to be broken down through gluconeogenesis, which throws away a lot of energy, sometimes almost half. 
However, unlike meat or fruit, starch is highly storable without any modification. And unlike fruit especially, it's available all year around. And that consistency is key to brain evolution. Because imagine if you have all these calories and you end up with these really smart babies, but then you can't feed them, you end up with really smart dead babies. So when Trace says, and we know all this by the size and shape of the guts that we find. It's really that we can guess what we ate and that likely it was just less raw foliage requiring a smaller digestive system. Well, many people like to look at that and say it was meat that shrank our digestive system. It very well could be starch because starch involves a smaller digestive system. You don't need to have the large jaws to eat it. The majority of starch is digested by our pancreatic amylase, while some of it is from our salivary amylase, and therefore you don't need that super long colon to take care of starch. And these aren't my ideas, they aren't just the ideas of a ranting vegan dude on YouTube. I got these ideas from a variety of anthropologists like Dartmouth anthropology professor Nathaniel Dominey. So because there's not a very strong match between meat consumption and increasing gradual increases in brain size, scientists have looked to other options. And given that plant foods are such an important part of modern humans that hunt and gather foods, um, the money is on plant foods and a shift in the kinds of plant foods as being the major driving factor in, in increasing brain size. A mix of plant foods with a large amount of starch coming from tubers and seeds. That's the, that's the fundamental component of the human diet. Now I wanna move on to this study from 2015, and it's worth noting that that period from two and a half million years ago to about 10,000 years ago is also known as the Pleistocene. So from that study, they say, quote, we propose that plant foods containing high quantities of starch were essential for the evolution of the human phenotype during the Pleistocene. Going further, quote, we provide evidence that cooked starch, a source of preformed glucose, greatly increased energy availability to human tissues with high glucose demands, such as the brain, red blood cells, and the developing fetus, starch babies. So we clearly need to address cooking here. It's unclear exactly when that started, but let's prescribe to the view of the chewing study mentioned earlier that cooking was apparently uncommon until 500,000 years ago. So looking before cooking, when we had that major growth in brain size, this raises the huge question of how come other animals like pigs who were also eating these underground starchy organs didn't end up as smart as us? They are smarter than dogs though. Worth noting. To answer this, I wanna present my completely new, never before disclosed theory of evolution, which I call the starch runner hypothesis. This is my explanation for how we evolved into the best long distance runners on planet Earth while simultaneously becoming the most intelligent creature, at least by our anthropocentric standards. In other words, how we became the majestic and gangly humans that we currently are. Those of you that have read Born to Run already know of our running ability. He highlights the Tara Umara tribe of Mexico in which members have been recorded running 200 miles in one go. And our entire body has evolved to do this. Everything from our gangliness that Trace was talking about to our weird springy club feet, our upright posture, our bare skin, and so on. That is all a result of long distance running evolution. But what drove that evolution? Going back two and a half million years ago, the forests started drying up a bit into plains and that is our evolutionary stage. So as we evolved more lanky gangliness, we leaned out and got springier ankles that recovered more energy. We were able to cover more and more distance. With more distance meant more access to more plant calories in the form of reserves of underground storage organs, or perhaps a grove of date palms, all of those foods we find in the fossilized dental plaques of our ancestors. Here's a map that illustrates the math. You have patches of major reserves of plant calories, maybe 100,000 there, 50,000 there. Let's say by running from patch to patch, you can access an average of 500 plant calories per mile ran. That would just be an average. If you can run 100 miles in a day, which modern humans can, that gives you access to way more calories than if you were only able to run, say, 15 miles. That's 50,000 versus 7,500 calories. Minus the 100 or so calories we might burn per mile, and yes, starch is a way better running fuel than meat. It's carb loading, not meat loading. And it makes sense why we're such good slow runners because plants can't outrun us. So you can imagine an ancient tribe of humans that would send out a few scouts and would be able to cover hundreds of miles and then they could just migrate accordingly to the food source. 
But since I mentioned Born to Run, I have to mention the idea of persistence hunting and why I don't think that is how we got our calories during this time before we could hunt. Persistence hunting is when you just chase an animal for so long that they become exhausted and collapse. And my argument against it is that you can't outrun an animal until you've evolved to be able to outrun an animal. It's a paradox. However, with plants, the further you run, the more of a reward you get, and it slowly builds up and forces us to evolve into the best long distance running animals on Earth. And then we eventually harnessed fire, and that allows us to extract about 20% more calories from starch. So yeah, you can only get about 80% of the calories from raw oatmeal that you can get from cooked oatmeal, for example. And no, I'm not completely denying that we ate meat. I'm not that off my rocker as a vegan. I know that meat played a role. I just think it's way smaller and probably comparable to something like nuts. Starch was the ticket. Okay, let's move on to Trace's comments about B12. Ugh. That said though, we shouldn't stop eating meat altogether. We do need to eat meat. Even vegans need something from meat called vitamin B12. It only comes from meat, eggs, and dairy. It's a meat product or a animal byproduct, no matter what. He basically says that evolutionarily, we had to eat meat to get B12. That's how much our bodies rely on meat product or animal product, that if we don't eat it, our nervous system doesn't function particularly well and we get anemia. Vegans who don't want to damage an animal or have moral quandaries about it, they still need B12 and they get it through a bacterial byproduct that is then put into a supplement or fortified into vegan foods. He didn't mention that all B12 comes from bacteria, whether you get it from meat or not. He clarified this a bit in the comments, but still said that it's not how we get our B12 today, nor is it how we evolved. True animal source is definitely the main source of B12 in today's diet, but looking through evolutionary history, there are several other ways that we could have gotten our B12. Number one, there is untreated water. Looking at this study, many of the lakes had enough B12 in one liter to meet our daily requirements. There is also poop, which is teeming with bacteria, and we certainly would have got trace amounts of fecal matter in our mouth before hygiene happened. Also, there is soil from this study, quote, soil is a rich source of B12 and getting a bit speculative, a healthy gut may be able to make enough B12 in your small intestine. From this study, healthy South Indian subjects had the ability to make B12, the bacteria and the conditions in their small intestines. We make a ton of B12 in our large intestines, but we can't absorb it there. Now it makes sense. No, in modern times, I would not bet on these sources. Supplements and fortified foods are definitely a safer bet, but heck, adding B12 to our municipal water supply might actually be a more accurate representation of how our ancestors got B12 than from meat. We'll never know. Now for the actual title question, could we evolve to not eat meat? I don't think this was actually fully answered in the video, but my answer is an obvious yes, we could. Under the right conditions, we can evolve into pretty much anything. We could eventually be ruminants that just eat grass if we wanted to be. But I would also say that we already have evolved to not eat meat. Those who don't eat meat or any animal products are also known as vegans, surprise, and from the epidemiological evidence, they have 15% lower mortality rates, 15% lower cancer, 78% lower diabetes. They also display an average normal BMI in the US, unlike other dietary groups, among many other epidemiological benefits. And we have clinical studies showing the reversal of heart disease on a vegan diet, which was likely largely caused by eating animal fat, but we're designed to eat meat. You just need to find that vegan source of B12, and since it's obviously not a good idea to eat poop or untreated water, you just need to take some type of supplementation, which is kind of like bacteria farming, which one could argue is more natural than artificially inseminating billions of animals, many of which we supplement B12, and then injecting salt into their flesh and plastic wrapping it, you get the picture. But don't forget, add some plants, I mean spices, to make it taste good. In the end, this is just a little bit of friendly debate. I definitely am not mad with Trace from Seeker. He's just preventing the conventional view, the same view that The Atlantic presents. He is at least open enough to push for a lower level of meat consumption and possibly afraid of vegans enough in the comments to say, Today, we do have some problems with meat eating. I'm not here to say meat is the best, everyone should eat meat. I don't think that that is true. I think vegetarianism and veganism has just as much of a place in society as omnivore 
carnivores, as meat eaters. I'm not here to judge, that's not my job. But as anthropology advances and we have more than just animal bones to look at because they stand the test of time better than yams and kale stems, it is clear that starch played a large role in our evolutionary history. We obviously ate meat, but it doesn't appear to have played that central role in that self-aggrandizing hyper-masculine view of our ancestry. And as I back up in my anatomy-related videos, we certainly did not eat enough meat to evolve, to make it into a health food for us. It's far from that. So starch was the ticket. I mean, it's still where we get most of our calories today. And really, I just like thinking about this stuff. I think it's super fascinating. If you still wanna to prescribe to the idea that meat played this massive central role in our evolution, well, we don't need it today. We don't need to eat it, and therefore, it's not an excuse to keep eating animals. Check a mate. All right, finally, share your thoughts down below. I'm really curious to know what you guys think about my Star Runner hypothesis, especially if you're an anthropologist, you have to comment below. All right, thanks for watching. Feel free to like and subscribe, and I will see you in the next video.